record. We are two ninjas, ball and movers. Yeah. And Brandon Collins. That's me. It's just the brand for your moving needs. Medium popcorn. Woo! You haven't seen it, well, we're gonna spoil it. Who's the master? Well, that's your one. In the house of Atreus, we shall rise. I'm Eddie Collins. Guys, this is Justin Brown. And we are Medium Popcorn. But you already knew that, didn't you? You sexy listener. Listen to our velvety voices in your ear holes. Uh, and then we're breaking down Dune Part 2, directed by Denis Villeneuve, one of our favorite auteurs of the past uh, 10 years or so. He's done Prisoners, Blade Runner uh, 2049, and of course... Fucking uh, enemy with the big ass spider uh, at the end. No, no, I don't want to talk. To <laughs> um, but seriously, he's done some really great films. Uh, Justin actually had never seen the first Dune before he was tasked with watching Dune Part Two. So I definitely want to hear about your journey watching these two movies. Did you watch them back to back? Like, how? What was your process in watching these? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> guys, first of all, you're not gonna like my process because I tried to watch the first Dune three times um, it's slow it's very slow especially if you're watching at home oh i fell asleep twice on it fell asleep yeah. twice on it. it it was not a pretty thing but then once i finished uh, uh do the first dune yesterday i then flowed into this one which is basically i watch six hours of dune lore yeah in, and um a part of me still has no idea what the fuck is going on yeah. Did you ever watch the 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 previous attempts at making the story? No, no. Like the Kyle I, Monahan, um, what David Lynch version from the seventies, I think, or something like that. The eighties. So that's the thing. Um, I was talking to my brother, we were talk- and we were talking. Was like, yeah, he was thinking, like, I think I want to go back and watch uh, the original. I said, I after watch, and now mind you, this is on two failed attempts. Uh, no, my first failed attempt to get through this, I was just like, I don't think I have it in me to go back and revisit anything from this franchise because mm. of how slow that original film, I, I mean, the first film is, and yeah. I don't know if it's worth it for me. That's interesting because I, I actually didn't, I was thinking about rewatching the first one before I saw the second one in the theater. And I was like, man, the first one was really slow, but the first one is, is like a, a setup to all the good shit that comes in the second one, like yeah. all the action stuff that happens, but you're like, you're like, this seems like a pretty simple story. It's like these, these people are just trying to get spice, which is what white men have always tried to do since the dawn of fucking it's land. The story of Christopher Columbus. Yeah, exactly. It's all about spices. And folks, if you didn't know that, that Christopher Columbus was looking for spice, and that's why he was pillaging all these worlds and shit, then you need to read up on your world history. I'm mm-hmm. just saying. Um, yep. that there's a reason why Thanos is all about he fucking is making spices and shit <laughs> when he never mind. What <laughs> after, after he does the snap? <laughs> remember he's like making stew and shit, like using <laughs> spices. I'm like, that's why we kill other people. Um, okay, so interesting. So, question for you: Denis Villeneuve said in that he believes you could go into Doom Part Two without any context for Doom Part One, based on you watching them back to back. Do you think that that's true? Could you have watched the second one without any context from the first? one? Technically, I think, yes, you probably could. Okay. But I also think that you'd have, there would be lingering questions there. But then again, at the same time, after watching one and then, and then watching two, I wouldn't want to have to go back and watch one again. You know what I'm saying? I think the reason that he said that, and like and I know this is gonna be pretty harsh, but the reason he said that because he didn't want people to go back and watch one, and then t- and then that would dissuade them from going to watch two. Okay, that's I can that's, I can just, that's just that's just my feeling of it. I, I think he was just like, yeah, you don't have to watch the first one. He's like, because that's two hours and forty uh, some odd minutes of of just whatever uh, dribble. Yeah, I I understand that. I, I understand that theory. I think um, 
because remember part one came out during COVID. So it was like that simultaneous HBO Max and theatrical yeah. release, which is really odd. I saw it at IMAX when it came out. And visually, it looked amazing. Story was, I remember thinking, like, all right, there's an emperor and there's this Baron dude that kind of is like an obese Darth Vader. And then yeah. he's got Dave Bautista as like his his nephew who's doing his bidding. And then they're trying to take out this one family. But then the one family, like the the mom is linked up with this like sisterhood that's quietly like pulling all the strings and shit like that. I'm like, okay, this seems very convoluted, but also feels like George Lucas might have read Dune, the book, and been like, I got an idea. Like, you know, it felt very much like uh, when Zuckerberg was working on that, um, <laughs> the fucking, the, you know, the, the Winklevoss twins idea. Huh? And then he's just like, I'm just going to take this. It, it felt, I was just like, how did they, how did the state of uh, the creator of Dune, uh, what's that writer's name? Fuck. Uh, uh, d- 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 it's a popular book series, obviously. And apparently the sequel, the books get crazy. Because there's a bunch of them after. Because the, the first two movies are based off the first book. And then there's uh, sequels. Um, Frank Herbert. I'm not sure how Frank Herbert's estate didn't sue George Lucas, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know. Um, yeah, UV is asking the chat, am I pronouncing the director's name uh, wrong? I thought it was D- Dennis. No, he actually says Denis. Denis Villeneuve. I watched a lot of uh, interviews recently with him and Christopher Nolan. That's why I'm all like nerdy about it and shit. Um, okay. The second one, I got to say, the second one, I rewatched parts of it to prepare for this review because I, you know, I watched it when it first came out in theaters. It's mm-hmm. almost three hours, folks. I'm sorry. Um, yo, I got to say, though, Florence Pugh can't open a movie as like by herself, but she is fucking I, I don't know what it is about her, but she's so beautiful. And the way they dressed her up in this with like the different outfits and stuff. I was like, yo, she looks bad as fuck in this movie. Yeah. Um, Timothy Chalamet actually kind of finally stepped up. I kind of get what the hype was. I call me by your name. I was kind of like, I kind of get the appeal. This one I was like, all right, he's doing something interesting here because he's basically this dude that his mom is manipulating to make it seem like he's the fucking Messiah. Yeah. He's like, I'm not the fucking Messiah. She's like, yes, you are. Yes, you fucking are. And then he's like, finally, like, I guess I am the Messiah. Like he's buying into his own bullshit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's going to lead everyone into war. And I was like, Oh, like the ending of this movie was so frustrating because between that, him ascending to the throne, killing all of his enemies, almost like Godfather, right? Godfather esque, and then Zendaya being like, "I see where this motherfucker's going. I'm going. I'm going back. Like fuck this shit." And then, but then there's that tension between her, Florence Pugh, who's going to now marry Paul Atreus, and I was just like, I remember like I leaned over to Tati when they both looked at each other, Zendaya and Florence Pugh. I was like, drama. But that's like the last twenty minutes, and I'm like. Fuck. <laughs> like I want him to get more of that shit. So my thing about so where does this fucking baby in her stomach that now has the that she's talking to? Like what this so change many... that. Yeah. Apparently the daughter's already born and like she's the one that kills the baron, I guess, in the book, but they have her still in like the womb or something like that. But then we have a flash forward where she's played by Anya Taylor Joy randomly. Um yeah, that guy that got weird. There's there's some parts with Rebecca Ferguson where I was like this is this is cuckoo bananas. Yeah. Right? I She's I hot it, though, right? Who? Rebecca Ferguson. This is the first oh, movie where I was like Yeah, no, like, she looks greatness. Between looks- this and uh what was the movie The Shining sequel? Fuck. Uh Doctor Sleep. Doctor Sleep. I was like, "Yo, she's an underrated baddie." Eh, I, when she I mean, had the little rose the hat. She looked hot in that. I mean, like, no, she, she, she's a, she's a pretty woman. I just don't know if I'd say she's a baddie. But regardless, pretty woman walking I, down I, the street. I'm, I this movie is just, it's one of the slowest things I've had to watch in a while. Mm. And even I find like, yes, the second one has more, um, has far more action, right? Yeah. And for yeah. I, I'll, I'll give it this: this film is beautifully shot. It Walk looks. In. His cinematographer, who is that? Uh, Greg Frazier, definitely going to win. At least be nominated for Oscar, if not win. Like, yeah, like the the scene where like he, they're taking out the Batista's people before he retreats. Mm-hmm. I was like, this looks fucking awesome. Yeah, like like it 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 looks 
it looks it's very visually uh, appealing like I, I loved watching it uh but i just wish that i was watching something else as far as the story it was um every, i don't know it just felt every scene just felt like it was dragging um you know i i, I felt that zendaya she looked great uh in the film yeah uh, but like at the same time i just didn't care I, and that's interesting you say that because I'm looking at his filmography, right? He's got Prisoners, Enemy, Sicario, fantastic. Arrival was fantastic. But for those movies, he wasn't the writer. For Dune and Dune Part 2, he was a co-writer. And so I'm wondering if just writing's not his strong suit to get that emotional hook. Because even, even a movie that's obscure and uh, like abstract as Enemy, I felt like there's still something there where we both were like, like we gotta watch this a few times, but then we both were like, we're oh, not gonna no, watch like, it. Yeah. But we're not gonna watch it again because we're definitely afraid of spiders. <laughs> but we're like, you know, we're, we're like, there's some cool shit going on here. Like Sicario Prisoners, like he visually, he's one of the best directors in the game right now, for sure. Um, but I agree with you. I feel like it's it's an emotionally cold movie. It, there's yeah. there's nothing really to resonate with. Even the love story between um Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet, I'm like, cool, but like you can kind of tell this ain't gonna end well. Yeah, whatever's going on here. Harvey Bardem is fucking became became becomes a religious zealot halfway through it, just like he's the chosen one. Um, which provide a little bit of comic relief, but then at the same time, you're like, but this is where this gets dangerous, right? Because he becomes such a fanatic along with the other people, where you're like, oh, they'll follow this psychopath to whatever he wants to do. Well, it's also just the fact that he's just like, listen, like I'm not the chosen one. It's just like, he's, and they're like. That's something that the chosen one would do. He'd say he's not the chosen one because he's so humble. It's like Fight Club, right? Bro, it was nuts. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> like, oh no. <laughs> Which that has to be that has to be a mind fuck. When you're like, yo, for real, like I'm not, I'm not the dude. And everyone's like, okay. <laughs> you're like, what do I have to do or say you to get you? <laughs> That's fucking yeah. crazy. That's so scary. Because that the amount of power and then for him to fully embrace it at the end, like. I was like, okay, like this is getting interesting, but now the movie's over. And apparently the second book isn't that great. So it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. They do, in fact, make a third one, which they're going to, because it's made a bunch of money, almost half a billion dollars worldwide. Um, but you're right. Zendaya was really strong in this. I don't... Zendaya is in an interesting place because she clearly is a movie star, right? Mm -hmm. And she's fantastic in you for it. There's a reason why she won two Emmys in a row for that show, right? But... I think feature wise, I've yet to see a performance and this includes challengers where she's great in it. But like I said, in the review with Tatiana, she unfortunately has the, she has the third best performance out of the three leads in that yeah. movie. That's all I'll say. And I have yet to see a feature where I'm like, that's his day I've been waiting for. That's his day that like I've, I've been hearing about, you know, the same way I felt with Timothy Chalamet for this. I'm like, I'm just waiting for that for Zendaya. Austin Butler surprised me in this. Um, I was disappointed to find out that he didn't fully shave his head, that that's a ball cap. Yeah. But he was he, that villain was fucking nuts. Okay, here's the question. Is he in the first one? No. No. Because remember, they have Batista. The Baron has Batista's character being charged with killing the Atreus family. And when he learns in the second one that they're still alive, that's when he's like, fuck you. I'm going to get your my, you know, your better brother your, you know, to, to take them out. So... And it really felt uh, to me watching this film was just like, oh, this guy came out of nowhere. Mm. And, and so like, and I think that, you know, as far as villain wise, he was the best person in the film as a uh, villain. Um, the, you know, the Emperor Palpatine uh, type uh, dude was so fucking weird and worthless. And gross. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was worth it, it. He he was pointless in this film. Like, I, I didn't understand why he was in it. And it's like, yeah, I know everyone had like, oh, there's a guy pulling the strings. He's behind, the, you know, but like make him something that, you know, you, you kind of like, oh, like this is like, like, I don't know. It, it just felt like it, it was he was just a pointless character throughout mm. this entire thing. So Austin Butler comes in and he's the big bad now, right? He's the big bad, but like, what does he really do? Yeah, I mean, he he's the one that like sets the aggressive charge against like the, 
you know, the the Fre- Freeman um, and shit like that. And he, like, you know, does the advances where they start to sort of get the upper hand on everyone. But, yeah, it's it's more like to show that he's a formidable villain physically, you know, like, to, to Paul, which, you know, I really enjoyed that fight at the end, like, because I'm like, oh, they're fucking each other up. Like, this is actually good. Because I, I like to see my heroes get beat up. I yeah. hate it when it's like things come too easy. And it seemed like for a point for a minute, Paul, things were coming too easy. When then nigga like rise the sandworm, I was like, okay, like I get he's like he's real he's a quick learner and he's a skilled dude, but like that's fucking nuts. Man, do you imagine you have to run across? First of all, I hate sand. I don't know about you. I hate sand. So I gotta run across a fucking sand it's dude. Hard to run on. It's hard to run on. Sand is really hard to run on. Like on a beach, that shit's hard. No, 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 I mean, it's you great. Fall it's, on shit. It's great training. Oh, Maybe for your legs? Uh, uh, for your like, for your for your legs, your, your lungs. Like it, it's 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 like it's like resistance training. Okay, right? interesting. And, yeah, a lot, a lot of athletes uh, do it. Just you know, even just for rehab as well. Okay, every uh, every June I go to Jones Beach and I take a mushroom uh, chocolate. And I'd be tripping out just walking, like you know, watching the ocean. But I think mm-hmm. this year, what I want to do is. I'm going to take the, the chocolate, but before it kicks in, I want to run along the beach, listen to the Baywatch theme song. I think that'd be fun. It's you should come. People stand in the darkness. You should come with me. Let's do it together. We should make a video of this, and you're running, and I'll run behind you singing the song. I'll be ready. I'll, I'll be ready. ready. <laughs> Let's do it. I want to I wanna do that. Um, I'm down. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the like thing. Couple, <laughs> 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 People just watch us like that. Gay couple is really tripping balls. <laughs> They're singing a Baywatch theme song together, <laughs> and then we just start chanting Hasselhoff, Hasselhoff. <laughs> and I'm and I'm really going. <laughs> Never want to be. <laughs> I actually was listening to that song the other day. And I feel like I had like a mean mug on my face. It's like that you know, the meme where the black dude's mm. looking real hard, but like you listen to like some goofy shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, but back to Austin Butler, I I will say like uh, he he did the work. So actually, I watched the video of him doing the training, the knife training and stuff, and he's like working with the stunt team, like really doing it. And apparently, he took a voice. Uh, he had a voice coach that actually sound more like Stellan Skarsgård, which you know I'm like I appreciate that. But then Batista's over here just sounded like Batista. So, <laughs> but I, again, I got to give credit to Batista. Like he didn't have much to do in this movie because he had more to do in the first one, but yeah. he's working with some great people. He's, he's got to be like, he's got to be impressing them in some capacity to get all to work with some of the best directors in the game. Yeah. There's just know, a handful he hasn't worked with at this point. You know, it's interesting because like, um, I don't, he, he it's seemingly from from the things I've heard, he wasn't necessarily easy to work with uh, in the WWE. Mm. And so maybe it was just like the environment just wasn't uh, good for him because mm. outside of the WWE, it seems like everyone loves him, um, you know, and or maybe and, and it could just be the fact that he's a big fucking dude. And maybe he, he he's in real life. He's he's kind of, a, you know, you know, a big old teddy bear, you know. Even though, like, I've, I don't know. So, like, it, it's just he, seeing him coming from WWE and, you know, kind of some of the things, the behind the scenes things I've heard about Batista and, and whatnot. I didn't expect him to be uh, this embraced in Hollywood. But, you know, I think it's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I'm, I'm glad to see it for him, though. Same, same. I, you know, I think, you know, and he did an interview like um, in promo for this when he was like, you know, talking to with, you know, people about working with Denis, Denis Villeneuve. And he basically said like him getting put in Blade Runner 2049 kind of started like more directors taking him seriously as an actor. He's like, yeah, it was great what I did with, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy and what um, James Gunn did for me, that opportunity. He said, like, but it was like Blade Runner that really like started having people look at me in a different way. And yeah. It, he got emotional because he's like, Denis actually validated me as an actor. And I think that he probably is someone that does take himself pretty seriously and takes the work seriously. And between Josh Brolin, Rebecca Ferguson, um, Timothy Chalamet is trained in acting. So I can see this being the kind of environment where he probably thrives. You know what I mean? I think that that's why 
a lot of people like a lot of people I think praise uh like directors like uh Christopher Nolan and um Regina King and things like that because they're very technical and they know how to communicate with actors, but they're also very professional. And I think they they keep they keep everything very tight and you understand the vision, you understand what you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're if he's a professional and he takes things seriously, this is probably the best environment for him. He's probably fucking having a great time. Yeah. Even with like a, even with, I'm sure Glass Onion, I mean, I've heard Edward Norton's a nightmare to work with, so maybe that wasn't as great. Um, yeah, but even like, uh, was that movie, uh, Hotel Artemis? I never saw that. How I was it? Good. He, he was actually really good in it. It felt like a John Wick knockoff. It was weird. Um, like the Continental? In Well, I mean, this was before that, so John would, not, would be a knockoff of that. Um, I mean, it came out of like John Wick 2. Well, That's it? why, yeah, it came out like at a weird time where I thought it might be. Well, so basically, it's like, the, but you have, it's kind of like, uh, not Safe House. Uh, oh my God, the movie with uh, Mark Wahlberg, where the guys are trying to get into to, to the place. You know, they're trying to break into this uh, the hotel, whatnot. Yeah. Um, but like, or hospital. It, it it's it's a it's a pretty interesting film, and I think yeah. that you know Batista did a great job uh, with it. And it's like, okay. I remember watch because that was after Guardians uh, came out, so he was just starting to you know get his burn. And and I watched, I was just like, oh wow, this is actually a, you know a pretty dope uh, film. You know, you know, especially for him because I didn't know where his career was gonna go, but yeah. like I would I would suggest uh, checking that film out. I would suggest okay. checking that film out. You, you'd be uh, you'd be surprised, especially considering the fact is how. Um, how early it was in his career, you know, his acting was. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That's the thing I think that keeps this movie above the fray is that the, before the actors, the star power alone is just insane. Yeah. Like it's, it's a really stacked cast. I mean, we haven't even talked about Christopher Walken and being in this, just being Christopher Walken as the emperor, but was fuck. <laughs> I loved it. I love because Christopher Walken is just, every time I see him, I don't know why I smile. Even if he's like supposed to be a bad guy or like menacing, it's just he's like a warm blanket. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because I've seen him play really crazy, but also really funny, and he's just versatile. I don't like. Do you have do you have any response to that? Like when you see Christopher Walken, like no, is it like you? Christopher Walken is Christopher Walken. Yeah, it's you just, know what I'm there just, are certain there are certain actors. Like you see him in the you see him in the film, and for some reason they bring a smile to your face. Yeah, yeah. you're just happy that you're happy to see him, no matter what it is. And like he's one of those guys. Like when I saw him, I was like, "Oh, Christopher Walker's in there. <laughs> That's pretty cool." He just, he's got that New York accent and a dude, and you're like, "Bro." <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, yeah, the Baron has to let he's let me down. Uh. <laughs> the Baron's let me down, you know. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> Are you going to give me more? <laughs> I know, uh, folks, a lot of people like cite the Kyle Bell sketch, but I recently rewatched that not too long ago. It's still so fucking funny. Oh, it's great. Just between like him, his deadpan and then like Will Ferrell be like, all right, I got, I'll give you more. I'll give you more. All right. <laughs> I'm, so I'm the cock of the walk. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but he's the oh, emperor and it's oh. so weird. Sir, yeah. no, no I, was, I was saying uh, Josh Brolin also being in this film, like, like you said, like you have a lot of you know names uh, in this, you know, Dave Bautista, um, uh, Josh Brolin. In the first one, you had um, oh Oscar Isaac, yeah, Os Oscar Isaac, uh, Jason Momoa, who I thought was ridiculous. He was great. He was great in the first one, though. I didn't, you didn't like I, it. I I thought that he was kind of hokey. I okay. mean. There, there were uh, like you know he's you know driving the spaceship and he has this you know smirk on his face things like that. I'm just kind of like get, get off the screen, do Damn. something like like I don't know because it, it's almost like he's trying to play everything as just like I'm the coolest guy on earth. You know what I'm saying? Which I'm just like stay in character. Don't you, you like? There's all of this shit going on around you. Yeah, it's just like live in the fucking moment. 
and stop smirking and trying to make yourself look cool. I know, I know. Like I really yeah. criticism, they, they, but like honestly, it's like if you watch that movie, there's a there's a shit eating smirk on his face at times where there should not be a shit eating smirk on his face. Are you still fasting? Yeah. Why are you so oh, angry? <laughs> no, no, but I, I find it I, I find it annoying. Oh, okay. I find it annoying. It's it's like, and, and it's a Jason Momoa acting uh, thing for me because mm. he's it's not the first film I've seen him do it in. Yeah, you're really not a fan of him. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's just because I don't think he lives in the moment. And, and he breaks character because he's trying to be just like, mm. this is the coolest thing. It's almost like he's just like, look at me acting. <laughs> and so, like... You'd be saying you need to watch him in Game of Thrones, but that's the thing, though, because that's like his first... That was like a breakout role from his Drago, right? I think... I think that's the name of the character from Game of Thrones. But also, he didn't speak English, and he died, spoiler everybody, after a few episodes of watching him. So you never actually got to see what more he could do. And I think once he started like getting lead roles, I, there he hasn't did. been an evolution. There hasn't been an evolution to Jason Momoa as an actor. I will I will say that. Like he hasn't he hasn't been growing the way that like we just said Batista has. Yeah. The, Batista's getting better. And I think I just read an article today about The Rock and like the reason why he may have gone back to WWE and stuff like that because things weren't going well on the film side of things. I I think I'm I'm hoping with the A24 movie that he's doing that he'll show a different side and he'll he'll start showing an evolution as an actor because yeah. I do think like to your point the shtick of like I don't know the coolest dude or like you know, it, it it wears out as welcome especially in a time where those kind of dudes are the ones that are destroying everything around us. Yeah, they are the problem. Um, yeah. So like. I, I guess it's the thing is like, and it's different from, you know, The Rock, you know, being himself in every film. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's different from that. And the fact is like Jason Momoa, it's almost like, it's like, I'm having fun filming a movie. Okay. And like, that's the kind yeah. of feel, feel that I get from him and a lot of his, and a lot of things. And I think that because, and I, I feel like it's a thing where when someone does get success uh, pretty early in their career and you're, and they're doing great things and and not and this is not like me hating uh on the guy because he's successful. I want people to be successful, you know, actors. I know how hard the business is, but I don't feel like they're necessarily doing the work to become a better actor and mm. and, and they're and they're enjoying the ride as opposed to actually, you know, making art. Okay. Or, or serving the project. And like there are mm. aspects of this of the first film where I saw Jason Momoa, I'm, I'm just like, bro, stay in the fucking scene. And it's like, and it's not the first film. It's not the first project I've seen. Like, I've seen him in a fucking commercial. And I'm just like, you just can't, you, you just can't just live in, live in the Oh, movie. that terrible commercial with Zach Braff? Yeah, like, it, it's just Oh, like, I hate that. With the, the flash dance. Parody. Yeah. It, it, it's like, I'm all, like, everybody, I think that everyone should have fun on set. But the fun on set should actually... Uh, should it has to make sense in context of what you're doing if that mm. fun is going to transfer on screen. Okay, and I don't think that he's quite learned that just yet. Okay, well, plus side for you is he wasn't a part two, so he didn't have to worry there about that too much. You, <laughs> you just had to deal with it for the first two and a half hours, and but after that, the, the next two hours and forty five minutes, he didn't have to do that. Well, I now. Mean, he he did, he was in the first like uh five minutes. Then he disappeared for like forty five minutes. Then he comes yeah. back. And he has this like fight scene where he's you know yeah. doing the sword tip thing. Let a uh, die knife shatter. <laughs> like, um, I will say, seeing this in the theater, I didn't get to see an IMAX, but seeing in the theater with when um, Paul first gets on the sandworm, that yeah. was pretty cool. Oh yeah, like, I can. Like his perspective and like getting standing up and stuff is terrifying because I'm like I would be fucked up. I'd be fucking. I would be spitting all over that nigga's back, and <laughs> just you would never see me again. <laughs> I would be dead, dead. You'd be like everyone's watching me and they just see me immediately spit, tumble back, and just disappear into the sand. <laughs> like, so, well, I guess he's not the Messiah. <laughs> do you think? Do you think that, like, you know, a motherfucker jumping on your back and hooking you and and like pulling apart your skin a little bit? Do you think that hurts that sandworm? 
I don't know, because at one point they got these niggas riding like ride shares and they got a whole fucking encampment in the back. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, well, first of all, the timing, how do you even get everyone on there at the same time? Yes. Yes. How do you how are y'all staying like in, it's like in dozens of people fucking, that have to all jump at the same time yeah. and all in the fucking the perfect flying V It's like also how do they just track where this sandworm is going to come? Well, I mean, I know well, they, they do that, the little thumper around. things. Yeah, yeah the yeah. little thumper things. But it's also it's just like, doesn't the sandworm like go on, like travel underground? Like, why all of a sudden is the sandworm just like, no, I'm just going to stay on the top. I'm just gonna, I'm just going to surf the top. Like all uh -huh. the, so I, oh, I got niggas on my back. I don't want to shake y'all off. I don't know. Oh, I I don't know how the sandworms work. I know that in future Dune stories, apparently they start mixing with humans and shit. So there's like a uh, human that's half sandworm. Yeah, it gets fucking. I told you, I've heard it gets really fucking weird. Folks, call in. Call in if you've uh, read any of the other Dune books. Uh, leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash media and popcorn. Let us know what y'all know about the future Dune stories because I heard they get a little crazy. Um, again, no wonder Star Wars uh, uh, took off and not this. <laughs> I, Star Wars is way more palatable. It's easier to follow, except for those prequels. That's when it got. That's when it got into shit like this, some political yep. shit. Like that's when it got really messy. But when it's just straightforward, like Sith, Jedi, you know, that's it. So that's the thing uh, <laughs> with this uh, with this series. It is very uh, much about like, hey. You it's you know, you you're you're part of a bloodline and uh this is your opportunity to ascend. You know, it is and then you know you're you're fighting the power because these people are trying to take over and you know we we're the ones, we're the chosen ones, uh who who can stop it and you know it, it's classical story, you're the chosen one, you're the savior, you're gonna be the you're the man in um with the white hat. Like it's pretty simple. And yeah. then when it goes, when you hit this um, uh, sequel, I'm just like, what the fuck happened? Mm. Because like, as much as I didn't like Dune one, a uh, part one, it was a pretty straight linear story. That was. Yeah, I, I thought it was really slow and, and, and it dragged, but you can follow once you got here. I was just like, man, who, <laughs> who? <laughs> where? Yeah. What? Yeah. It does get, like I said, it gets very convoluted and I'm just kind of like following for the visuals. I'm not, I really don't care. The ending, the ending was interesting though. Cause I'm like, all right, what does it look like when Paul is technically he's in charge of everything. He's starting a war. He's got this love triangle now. Cause if I'm Paul, I'm smashing both Shawnee and the princess. I'm like, I'm, oh, I get both of y'all. Like, yeah, we're going to have some fun. Um, and that's after he's killed the Baron. He's imprisoned the emperor. Like, and then you got the mom over here pulling. Well, they alluded that she's not pulling the strings the way she thought she was. Cause remember she does that weird Jedi telepathic conversation yeah. with the other woman from the sisterhood. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh, she's like, there is no win or lose. Like, you, you're you seeing this thing all wrong if that's what you think is happening right now. So they're alluding that there's even bigger conspiracy or things at hand, possibly. But, like, to your point, like, I'm kind of like, I'm going to probably see the next one. Like, I, I'd be very surprised if I didn't, just because I like seeing Villeneuve's movies. But I'm not going to care. I'm. Yeah, it's like, also, like, it's going to be a space thing. Well, I mean, I like sci-fi, so that's not a, that doesn't bother me. But no, 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 no. I, 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 I didn't mean that as a slight. So they're going off to space. So like the next movie is just going to be completely different. I like I don't know where uh, this thing is going to go. It's just like, that, and this yeah. didn't really leave you, you know, with any real idea of um, of of what's next or, or or what's to come. Well, yeah, that's why I'm asking, like, folks, like, for real, like, if you've read the Doom books or you know what's going to happen next, um, please, you know, leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash medium popcorn or you want to write us an email, mediumpod at gmail.com. Because I have heard that Messiah, the next book, isn't great and that it gets even it gets even darker and people do some really bad things. Like, 
and they're like they're like oh you're gonna not like paul anymore but i'm like i kind of already don't like paul like it's it's not like i'm rooting for anybody in this story to be honest with you even shawnee i'm like girl you can't tell that this white boy gonna turn once every every white person around him is whispering in his ear take this power utilize it fuck all these native people just use them to your advantage and you peeping all these whispers happening so you already know he even though he's trying to be like i'm pure like and i'm not going to be influenced by that you but know what he's about the battery in his back yeah because if he doesn't go along with the game then you got to wonder what do they want to do to get him to play ball mm-hmm. either they're going to fuck him up or rebecca yeah. ferguson's got a daughter coming no, they're they'll make her somebody else up yeah like <laughs> You know, and for me, that that was frustrating to watch. But again, it was also kind of like, I'm just watching this. Like, I don't really, I don't have any stakes in this story, ultimately. And I think that that's what's frustrating about his past few movies, that visually, I'm like, I'm glued to the screen. But story-wise, I, I couldn't give a fuck. Like, Blade Runner 2049, probably top three best-looking sci-fi movies I've ever seen in my life. Like, it's fantastic. Like, there's some scenes in that where I'm like, I'm in awe of how you did that. But I don't care about the Blade Runner story. I don't care about, like, I, I didn't like the first one. I know that's, like, kind of blasphemy to say, like, especially as a sci-fi fan. I did not care for the first Blade Runner. I I, I just couldn't connect with it, right? Yeah. And so the sequel, I'm, like, even further removed. But I, I'm not going to deny that's a beautiful piece of art. Same. You know, you got Ana de Armas as the hottest hologram I've ever seen in my fucking life. And you got dope sand dunes and it, it like hinted at what he could do visually for the Dune movies. I guess that's why a lot of people were excited when they announced he was doing Dune. But UV in the chat asked, does this movie wake you want to read the books? Not really. Cause I've, I have so first of all, I have so many books to read anyway. And I feel like the books might confuse me even more. It's like when I uh, started reading the Lord of the Rings books, I was like, I'm not going to do this shit. Cause JK, uh, uh, J.R. Tolkien spends like two pages talking about grass in the Shire and shit. I'm like, I don't need to do this. And it's not even like straightforward English. You know, it's in all like the posh, like, oh, the lily pads were floating in the, the effervescence of the, I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Just what's that? What's Frodo going to do? Fair. I, I, I don't think I, you could, you could pay me to read the books and I don't think I would really be that interested in it. Because I feel because after watching this film, I it, it it makes me feel like all right. So if the books is giving me more information about this world, uh, this is likely information that's gonna be kind of messy and mm. long winded, just like this film. Well, yeah, and also I think uh, from what I've heard is that the especially the second movie it deviates a lot from the book. So if I read the book, I might be, like I said, might be even more confused now because I'm like, well, why did he change that? Or, oh, that's different than what we saw in the movie. And now I got to think about, well, how is this going to work in the third one? Like, I, I just rather just watch this as entertainment and be able to forget about it. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it, it just doesn't connect it to me on an emotional level like some other fantasy and sci-fi series do. But again, I don't want to discount like that from it being entertainment and visually like, interesting i definitely don't want to discount that but again there's just not enough for me to hook on and it's clear that everyone's gonna probably die ever being real like there ain't no happy ending for anybody here rebecca ferguson's pretty much been a, taken over by some demon entity right she's over here talking in different like tongues and shit like that timothy uh, you know paul atreus is clearly going to become like some He's going to become uh, it's like an anti-hero at best, anti-hero yeah. at best. Right. He, he's going it, to it, he he has a very um, uh, kind of Darth Vader, a progression. Happening. He's like if Luke became Darth Vader, if yeah. Luke was like, oh, I'm going to go to the dark side. Yeah, that's that's all it is. And it's like. I just like you, like you said, like, it's kind of hard to care. And they killed they killed the most interesting villain they had in this right like i mean i don't i don't i don't really know what there is to be excited about with a third one um and then there's also that uh we didn't talk about leah 
Sindukes, who played Lady Margaret, uh, who was like part of that sisterhood, and she's sussing out whether or not they can manipulate uh, Fred uh, Rada, played by you know Austin Butler, to see if they can manipulate him if he does usurp the throne after taking out Paul Atreus and stuff like that. And I was like, they keep trying to shove this French actress down our throats, and I just do not get it. Do you understand, Justin? No. Do you understand the hoopla with her? Because no. they had her in the James Bond movies recently, where she's the first James Bond baby mama. I was like, out of all the Bond women, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> out of all the Bond women that got the got knocked up with the James Bond seed, it was her. Mm-hmm. We had Halle Berry as a Bond girl. We had Anna de Armas as a Bond girl. We had mm-hmm. Monica Bellucci, one of the hottest Italian women on the planet as a Bond woman. Also the oldest Bond woman, too. Okay. And this is this tired French woman? Okay. Okay, niggas. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just I just don't get like her appeal. Like I I don't think she's a great actress. Um <laughs> I, there's so many other French actresses that are better than her. I just don't understand why she keeps getting so much shine. Um Listen it's it's that. baffling. It, it, that's that's just the world we live in, baby. I know. I know. It's just a Oh, I guess this is a good good topic to bring up since we're we're about to wrap this up soon. Hollywood stars, right? This movie made uh 500 million dollars worldwide so far, right? Well, actually 700 million dollars worldwide on a budget of 190 million dollars. So it made a 500 million dollar uh, profit. Yeah. Uh are Zendaya and Timothy Chalamet are they movie stars at this point? Because remember, Timothy Chalamet also had Wonka, which did over uh, almost half a billion as well. And Zendaya, she obviously has the Spider-Man stuff. She's Euphoria. She's got a huge social media following. Are they movie stars? Are they the new generation of movie stars? Honestly, I don't. I think this uh, Zendaya is. I don't think that uh, Timothy, uh, Timothy Chalamet quite is just yet. Yuvia says yes, but I just told you Timothy Chalamet now has two movies that made almost a billion dollars. Yes. Each. But yes. Each. And he headlined them. Yes. The day has not headlined the movie yet. Yes. But at the same time, it's not based off of how much you're selling box office or anything. It's also presence. Um, a presence as far as like media and things like that. I think Zand- Zendaya has a larger pre- has a larger presence overall within uh public appearance, you know, the public. So I think she's more of the the star than he is. Okay. Even though he's the star of this film, this is a Zendaya film. Yeah, but you're you're not. I don't think you're quite answering my question because I'm talking about movie stars. I'm talking about movie stardom. Yeah, she's a star. They're both Hollywood stars. But Challengers, for instance, right, just came out, mm. made fifteen million dollars, right? Yeah. If every one of her social media followers bought a ticket, it would be like in like it'd be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, right, for opening week. Mm. So. I'm thinking Timothy Chalamet's team probably set him up where he had these back-to-back hits. Mm-hmm. Zendaya is yet to have a hit that's riding on her back in a feature film. Fair. So I, for me, that's why I'm like, yes to Timothy and no to Zendaya, just because I need to see what she does when she's headlining a film. And like what that looks, because I think that would be a good test to see how her social media power would translate to box office sales. But but that's the thing. That doesn't matter anymore. It like it it doesn't mm. it doesn't quite matter Maybe. anymore. The game has changed so much. Like I, I don't think that necessarily matters as much as it did in the past in the past. I would say um yeah like yeah, you can you can sell all these tickets and things like that, but it's like this name right here and all the shit that she's attached to is is probably worth more because people are just like, regardless of the fact is that like, yeah, maybe, you know, her, her, you know, solo led film, well, that's solo led film, but you know, the, the film that she leads isn't getting the same kind of recognition or making the same uh, dollars. Yeah. But at the same time, this is like a larger scale epic, right? So a lot more marketing dollars are going behind it. Right. This this costs, tw- you know, almost two hundred million dollars to make yeah. a Zendaya film where maybe 
it costs, you know, you know, X amount of dollars. Like, let's say it costs ten million dollars to make, but they bring in, you know, fucking, I don't know, thirty. You know, to them, that it's like, yeah, like obviously this this film, like you, you want a bigger, you, you want that five hundred, you know, you know, basically half a billion dollar, um, you know, a payday off of it. But Zendaya, they have to do less promotion because she is the promotion. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, you be in the chat said uh, in my circle of friends, I think people are wanting to watch this movie more because of Zendaya. So, okay. I mean, I just am curious to see what she does when she's fully headlining and owning a movie. Yeah, um, I, um, I just don't think so- it necessarily matters the way that you used to because in... And I, I, I 100% agree with you in the sense of the way, you know, things are, I guess, the, the typical structure of Hollywood. And the, but I think th- those days are kind of are, are, are going away very fast. That's and wild. we're moving into like a whole new era of like what a real star, you know, quote unquote, is mm. and what a movie star is. Yeah, yeah, and UVA said, especially with streaming now. Yeah, everything's topsy turvy now. But um, yeah, I, I'm I'm just curious because I think uh, without having some concrete movie stars, like the industry is just in more dire straits. But that's the thing; they don't want concrete movie th- stars. They want properties. Mm. Because a property, they can sell it. A movie star that means somebody is is they're beholding to this one person who is who who is attached to this thing and they have to pay that person. If it's all about properties, they'll get you to come back to spend for that property. They could get somebody, they could plug somebody else in for cheaper. They don't want to pay, yeah, especially now with AI. Yeah, I feel like we're just a few years removed from somebody being like, "Yeah, you can use my likeness and just put me in this movie." They won't even know. I mean, it's already happening now. Gwyneth Paltrow didn't even know she was in Spider Man. No. <laughs> she was like, "I was in Spider Man with you," but she talking to John Favreau. He's like, "Yeah, we were on set like all day together." She's like, oh. "They just call me." <laughs> She's like, "Oh yeah, that's right." Oh. I mean, that makes sense though, because if you're just called in for one scene and you get like two pages of dialogue, you're not gonna like. Hey, you like, for- which Marvel project is this? You're gonna be like, "Okay, is this Avengers?" I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you're like, "I don't, I don't care." So like, and that that's the thing is like, it, it's it's really scary because you see, uh, we're getting to a point where it's we're watching a pure devaluation of people mm. and artists even more than we're already uh, devalued, you know, societal in a societal sense, but yeah. like just as an artist, you know, is being devalued and you know by the industry that that we make our money. That's very true. Very true. But um, we did get some Patriot thoughts on Dune Part 2. And folks, remember, we still have a Patreon at patreon.com slash media and guaranteed to have your thoughts and reviews of that film shared in that episode. So first up was from Sean the Terrible, who wrote, I loved it. I hate, hate how they got regular ass names like Fred and Sarah. Yeah, old Ralph over there riding a giant space worm while shooting a la- laser cannon. <laughs> it's like, all right, damn. Uh, uh, good point. And Sid Tobias wrote, epic. It was a great watch in IMAX. I do wish I saw an IMAX. That's for sure. Um, I just think it, were, I think that I think the story was bad. Yeah, but like it was. Yeah, this this was sold out like crazy in IMAX. I was like, I'm not I'm not going out of my way to to make that happen if you know they won't have the seats ready. Um, they're just looking at some uh, some trivia. Stellan Skarsgård's uh, body makeup took eight hours to apply and two hours to remove for every day of shooting. He didn't drink anything and took Imodium pills in order to avoid having to go to the bathroom during shooting days. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's nuts. I mean, that's like a, I'm reading for some reason, like I've, I've read more about actors that have had to do like long makeup sets and stuff like that. And like how disappointing it is when like shit gets cut or when people are running behind, like other stars are running behind and shit. It's like, bro, I'm in this. I'm doing makeup for hours. Like, how are you not on time? I don't I don't get how you run behind for a film. I mean, outside of, you know, they're, you know, they're having you do some sort of press or something like that for the film that you're on. 
or like like oh you have another project that's ending and you have to and you have to do that and you have to uh, run the set like maybe like that is kind of forgivable but i don't get how people are just coming late to set if like you're like this is the job that you're on and you're like you've committed to this for x amount of time it's like what are you doing like that bothers me well i mean there's a recent article to talk about the rock a, a few minutes ago where apparently this new Amazon movie he did with Chris Evans went way over budget because he was hours late at times. Mm. So apparently maybe that fast, fast beef about the punctuality wasn't about Vin Diesel. Yeah. I mean, it, it could very well be, yeah. or it also could be the fact is like somebody has, you know, a little too much on their plate. That's it. Yeah, you know what I'm maybe take a, step, take a step back. That's why you have a team. Yeah, but if that team is also a shit show, I mean, it, it's, you know. Yeah, I know. That can impact things, too. Uh, Austin Butler said he toned down his method acting for playing Freed Aratha. Said, I've definitely in the past with Elvis explored living, living within that world for three years and that being the only thing I think about day and night. With Fade, I knew that that would be unhealthy for my friends and family. So I made a copia- conscious decision to have a boundary. Yeah, that's probably pretty best. Because imagine yeah. that fucker started acting like a serial killer. Just walking around with, with a sword in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> with just darkness in his mouth. They're like, nigga, you okay? <laughs> they only pay you like 200 G's, my, my bro. Like, what are you doing? Um, how, how I'd be so pissed off if I only got paid $200,000 for this movie. For a movie like this. I mean, some dudes, some people, some actors work at scale just because they want to work with certain, you know, yeah, directors and production. Like, I think Jonah Hill, he only made like, he claims he only made like 70K off of Wolf of Wall Street just so he could work with Scorsese. I'd be like, fuck it, Scorsese, pay me. I don't know, man. I mean, I, I think, for, okay. Oh, was it 150, Uvia? Okay, 150. Um, that's still. Yeah, it's the, like it's the bare scale and shit. Because I was like, yeah, 70 seems low because that movie was already three hours. And so that means there's at least like seven hours of footage. Like, that's insane. Um, but yeah, some people did take the pay cuts so they can work with talented people or like, you know, work within the budgets available and stuff. I mean, he yeah. got an Oscar nom. So maybe he's like, this could be this could be my next, you know, move. I want to do it. Yeah, I don't know. That was a great role too. So I mean, it, it was, it was, but also it's just like I feel like, hey, that's how they get you. Mm, maybe, maybe. <laughs> you know that. By how the they... way, that feels like Wolf of Wall Street. I watched that not too long ago. That's like the feels like the last dangerous movie for like <laughs> they said some wild shit in that movie. Oh yeah, <laughs> they said some <laughs> problematic shit in that movie, and they I remember seeing that on Christmas <laughs> when it came out, <laughs> but. They used to release some really fucked up movies on Christmas. What happened to that? Because I remember seeing Django on Chain on Christmas. Yeah, I don't because they're trying to put Christ back into Christmas. Right? <laughs> Christ, what is really? uh, the Sandworm riding sequence took forty four days to film and was shot on a set measuring ninety by twenty four feet. Holy shit! There's a dude I saw like at an AMC. Who did like this this weird animatronic thing where he was riding a like a uh, animatronic sandworm, and he had the whole get up and everything. It was pretty cool. That's that that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> niggas niggas are crazy, but they can be mad inventive though. Yeah, no, 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 no. You know what? It's a lot, but it is really fucking cool. The, some yeah. of the stuff that, that people have come up with. I mean, I and I say that is like that's that's a lot only because I can't do it. Yeah, because if I can well, do it, oh, my black ass would be right there. Well, that's actually what got me excited for the new Alien movie that's coming out soon. Because apparently they use a lot of practical effects, mm. and they actually showed the face huggers and how they're moving. And I'm like, oh, that looks cool. Yeah, like back to basics, not this CGI shit. Thank God. Well, I mean, so y- you know that there's, uh, and well, well, I mean, well, we talked about it uh, uh, that there's talk about doing. Um, uh, the last Ronin, the Ninja Turtle film, yep. and things like that, and they talk about like actually people being in suits and not doing like the C- CGI or less CGI and yeah. more, you know, more in tune with the original Turtles. 
or maybe it's a continuation of the uh, original. Like, I'm so on board for that shit. Mm. It looks so much better. And, I, you know, like, and yes, CGI yeah. does look great. It does look great. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if it's done the right way, and, and because yeah. I think original Turtles, they were lit so well, and that's what helped accrue, like, in, mm. you know, you into that world. And it's like, I just wish we got more of that as opposed to the the two flashy CGI. And it's like, the, the, you know, it, it's missing a lot of the shadowing and things like that that makes a gritty world. I mean, I think, yeah, if they can, if they can make the practical effects and make it work, like I'm all for that. But technology is so crazy now, like especially with Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I just watched a new clip of that. Mm. Um, I, that's fucking incredible, man. I just... Like that whole series, like if they use like Weta, whoever the fuck, like that could look really cool. But I, I, I trust that they're gonna make it look as good as possible either way, um, because that's a really good story. I think it's, it's almost too dark though. I think to be a commercial hit, that's a really dark story. Which uh, the last Ronin, that's really dark. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, but it's it's awesome. It's badass as fuck, but it's so dark. You're gonna have to see all the turtles die. And it's, and it's going to be, and I, from what I understand, it's going to be like a rated R story. Oh, it has to be. Yeah. Like it, it, the, the turtle, I'm not going to reveal which turtle is the one that survives and is, is the last Ronin, but yeah, they're fucking people up. Like they're killing people. Yeah. It's, it's wild. Yeah. It's like, a, like, if that's made, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Um, Jeez. <laughs> jizz, jizz. All right, we'll break down our rain system, baby. On that note, oh, Jesus maybe, maybe after I jizz. Hey guys, so you know how we <laughs> movies, bags of popcorn, small, medium, oh, me, baby. After I jizz, <laughs> small, medium, large, and the XL forty exceptional. If a film doesn't deserve any fresh, buttery popcorn, we throw we it jizz in on it. <laughs> popcorns pile. We pile piles of stale popcorn on the top of it. So, Brandon, we watch Dune Part Two. Starring Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Josh Brolin, uh, Rebecca Ferguson, Austin Butler, uh, Florence Ooh. Pugh, Dave Batista, Christopher Walken. What's yep. up, sir? I'm giving this a medium. Um, it, visually, it's one of the best movies I've seen in recent memory. Um, a lot of the performance is really, really solid, but it is incredibly long, unevenly paced. And just emotionally removed, like emotionally distant. I'll say that, not removed. Emotionally distant for a film. It's there's not much for me to really hook myself onto. And when a film has this much star power and has so many things going for it, but I really struggle to remember a few people's names and their relationships with each other and what that character wants. That's a problem. And so um, that's why it's getting a medium. It's still a solid movie. But I'm not going to be, I'm not an, like eagerly anticipating the next one. I'm just like, gonna, like waiting for it to come out. I'll be like, all right, cool. I'll go see it. But I'm not, this isn't a franchise that excites me in any way. Okay. Justin, what's your rating? Um, I think that just because something makes money doesn't make, necessarily mean that it's good. And uh, I think that this film misses the mark on a lot of aspects of, especially in the story uh, aspect, uh, emotional arcs. Um, but it really does deliver in cinematography. Um, but, and, and just scale because it, it is a pretty large scale film. They, bu they built a world uh, here, but I, I don't think that necessarily built a world that is worth me investing my uh, time in any further. Um, with that said, I'm going to give this uh, a small. Um, oh, okay. I, I I don't I don't see me revisiting this <laughs> anytime soon. Uh, if somebody else wanted to sit down and watch it, I'm going to leave the room. <laughs> I'll be like, hey, have fun with that. Oh wow. Okay. All right. Small from Justin. Can I, is is it fair to say this is probably your least favorite Denis Villeneuve film we've watched? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The both the both of them. So <laughs> one and two. Got it. Okay. And, well, and they have it's crazy because I'm actually putting one over it because I felt 
that one had was a little bit more linear and easy to follow while this one was kind of a little bit more all over the place. Mm, interesting. And, okay. and even though the one was, was by far a crazy slow. All right. Well, folks, that's our review on Dune uh, Part 2 and technically Dune Part 1 because Justin gave his thoughts on that as well. As always, you know, you can follow me at Frodo underscore Blackens on threads and Instagram. You can follow the show at Medium P Podcast and all social media platforms. And be sure to go to YouTube.com slash Medium Popcorn. Push that subscribe button to get alerted about all videos and celebrity interviews we have on the channel. And Justin, if you want to follow you as well, support the show financially, what can they do, my brother? Guys, you can follow me at J Brown did it on all the socials. And uh, if you want to support this show, you know, you got to go patreon.com slash medium popcorn. We have $2, $5, $10 and $15 packages. Guys, That's right. our backlog is on Patreon. We have bonus episodes. We got bonus. bonus. There's so much stuff on Patreon that if you like this show, if you love this show, if you just like yeah, this is a pretty cool show, you should be on Patreon because it's going to enhance your experience. So again, guys, take yourself to patreon.com slash medium popcorn. Sign up today. That's right. It's going down. Patreon.com. But if money's tight, just leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast application. We will read it on the show. And if you want to leave us a voicemail, again, especially if you've read some of the Doom books, leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash medium popcorn. Let us know what we should anticipate for future stories and what maybe was different. All right, yeah. y'all. Tell me why I'm wrong about this. <laughs> Tell you. Justin why he's wrong. Please help me. Help if, me. If, if, if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong about it and I'm, and I'm bugging, please feel free to tell me. And maybe I'll give you the second. No, maybe I'll, maybe I'll think otherwise. <laughs> maybe I'll, I don't know. Uh, I ain't gonna watch this again. <laughs> See, you're like, you're like trying to think about what's the compromise here. I don't know. I'm not committed. <laughs> I'm not committed, folks. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. Until next time, let thy blade chip thy knife or whatever the fuck they said. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Peace.